Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Julia Copley, Head of Operations, and on behalf of the MGAA, I'd like to welcome you to our webinar this afternoon. This is being hosted by the Robus Group. Before I introduce our speakers, just like to run through a few housekeeping points, if I may. If you could please ensure that your microphone and your camera is off. If you'd like to ask a question, which will be answered at the end of the presentation in the Q&A session, please use the chat button at the bottom of your screen. If we run out of time and I don't have the opportunity to put your questions to our speakers, our presenters will be happy to pick this up post-event. Presentation is accredited for CPD points, if relevant to your ongoing professional development programme. The video of this presentation will be available on our website, uploaded to our YouTube channel. Please take time to respond to our feedback survey, which will be issued after this webinar, as this does enable us to deliver the best quality events to our membership. So today's webinar, Alternative Capacity Solutions in a Hard Market, is brought to you by the Robus Group. And I'd like to introduce you to Jamie Polson, Director and General Manager at Robus Risk Services Guernsey Limited, Steve Dando, Head of Placement from the Ardenner Group, and Andy Matthews, Managing Director at Robus Risk Services Gibraltar Limited. Jamie joined the board of the company in 2014 and has overall responsibility for the running of the Guernsey office. He also manages a wide portfolio of insurance vehicles, whereas the client lead and appointed to various client company boards. Prior to joining Robus, Jamie was part of the senior management team at Aon Insurance Managers, where he worked for 13 years. Here, he acted as operational executive for many captive insurance companies for large global corporates across industries such as aviation, manufacturing, banking, dairy, construction, as well as many others. Steve joined the Ardena Group in March 2019 to set up Ardena Portfolio Solutions and also as the head of placement broking across the group of Ardena businesses. Steve joined from Marsh UK, where he was head of speciality portfolio solutions in the UK. During his time in this role, Steve ran the Marsh Broker Facilities and Portfolio Solutions in the UK across the speciality businesses. Prior to his time at Marsh, Steve led the sales and broking strategy for the Howden Financial Lines Division, PIFI and DNO, across many of the major industry sectors. Last but not least, Andy is the Managing Director of Robus Risk Services, Gibraltar Limited, having joined the group in late 2018. Robus Gibraltar manage several direct writing insurance companies that primarily write UK personal lines and commercial business. Andy has had an extensive industry experience, including working the London market for more than 20 years. His experience in the UK motor in a direct capacity and as a consultant in a reinsurance broker. Andy worked for various divisions in Aon for 14 years before relocating to Gibraltar. So without further ado, Jamie, it's over to you. Thanks, Julia. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining the webinar today, and uh, thanks to the MGA uh, for this opportunity. Um, so we structured the presentation um, to ensure that we meet the certain learning objectives for today around uh, capacity, capacity solutions, and that's been divided into uh, four different segments. So firstly, Steve will provide some background on the uh, current market conditions and the challenges being faced by uh, UK MGAs. I'll then uh, provide some background around the structure and domicile considerations if you're looking at setting up a risk retention. Just give you some background on, on what a risk retention vehicle is, how you go through the feasibility considerations, um, the processes required for formation and management. I'll then move on to uh, specifically onto reinsurance options, um, which will be a focus on, on establishment and uh, running of a vehicle in Guernsey. And then finally, my colleague Andy will uh, provide an insight into direct writing vehicles, and that is uh, based in Gibraltar. Okay. Thanks. Next slide, please. Th thanks, Jamie. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Steve Dando here. I won't ask uh, all of you if you can hear me, uh, but if you can't, please do feel free to, to, to sort of raise your hand or give me a shout. I'm, uh, I, I've been asked to talk a little bit about the, I guess, the context and, and the the capacity landscape um, that MGAs are, are dealing with. And it's a really interesting time to, to do that. Uh, just a little bit of context on my role within the Aldona group, uh, just to give you a bit, a, a bit of a sense of where we're coming at, at this from. So head of placement for the group, um, that includes sort of overseeing the, um, 
the capacity solution strategy within our MGA business. The MGA business within the Aldona Group uh, is about half a billion pounds of GWP and spans across personal lines, commercial lines, um, UK pet insurance, holiday homes, all the way up to some, some high-end sort of international global um, MGA solutions and international property and terrorism, etc. So hopefully what I'm able to give you uh, this afternoon is a, is a bit of a broad brush indication of some of the challenges we're facing um, and, and try and present some of the so some of our observations, I guess, from the market conditions at the moment. I think it, we need to take a step back somewhat just to get an understanding of some of the broader market dynamics in play when um, when looking at MGA capacity. I think over the recent years, there's probably been a, a, a couple of significant um, significant trends that have contributed to some of the challenges uh, we, we've found personally when looking for MGA capacity. I think the first is the proliferation of broker facilities. I think uh, broken organizations have looked at their placement strategies in slightly different ways and are, are creating portfolio solutions or broker facilities themselves. Now, whilst not, a, not a, a, an obvious link to, to an MGA challenge, what that does mean is that if brokers are adding additional remuneration elements onto these portfolio solutions on top of the traditional brokerage, when an insurer is looking at where to deploy their capacity and how to engage with their distribution network, broker facilities is, a, is an emerging trend that can conflict against their, their capacity deployment into MGAs. I, I think the other thing that we've seen, particularly in London recently over the last sort of three, three four years, but, but, but significantly last year, is this emergence of dedicated follow capacity. So, traditional insurance capacity that is set up at a lower expense and cost base to simply follow, um, fo follow business uh, typically in London. We saw it with the emergence of the key syndicate last year, which is, uh, has got some really interesting dynamics to it. But actually, sort of fairly quietly, there's, there's a lot of capacity in London that is now entirely dedicated to, to following, if you like. And I think, again, it just presents uh, an interesting dynamic or challenge to, to insurers when they're looking at the most efficient way to deploy their capital. I think the additional or the, or the second and pro, sorry, the, the third and probably the biggest backdrop, particularly in London, when we're talking about um, MGA capacity constraints has certainly been the, over the last two to three years, the, the performance review conducted by John Neal and the team at Lloyd's. Um, sort of it's referred to as the DSR 10 performance review and, and some of the quotes I think I put it in the deck I stop the rot which is a bit dramatic and uh, and isn't meant to be overly concerning but it, it what it effectively translates to is that Lloyd's is is applying increased scrutiny um, to capacity providers about how they're deploying their capital so naturally we see it across our business not just in MGA capacity challenges, but also on some of those broker facilities I referred to earlier, and also delegated underwriting authorities. We have a, a significant DUA book in one of our biz wholesale businesses in London, and there's no doubt that, that, that we are feeling an increased level of scrutiny being applied by the, the regulator, as in Lloyd's. Um, and this is on the back of some fairly obvious market conditions that, that, that you guys in the industry will have, um, will have been feeling. You know, most classes were, would, would reflect on certainly pre-2020 some fairly soft market conditions. Um, I think that's changing somewhat. So hopefully that, what that brings is profitability to our capital providers. But of course, I guess the unknown to an extent is the 2020 COVID claims um, that will be emanating um, from from the pandemic, right? So there's probably two two features to this, but one overarching piece. And the overarching piece is where insurers have signed up for wordings or products or or or, or facilities or MGAs or whatever it is, without really understanding their their pandemic open brackets COVID close brackets exposure. And we've seen this across our business. We've seen it in one of our NGA businesses in the UK um, leisure uh, arena. And we've also seen it on some of our broker facilities. So 
where we have had broker designed wordings um, that had a, a you know a BI uh, inclusion that the insurer typically wouldn't have had in their own wordings. Actually, if they've signed up for that as part of a facility, or indeed in in the uh, in the example I gave from our NGA as part of an NGA capacity, there's been some really difficult conversations. But I think what we'll see there as a as an emerging trend, excuse me, is probably a reluctance for insurers to certainly at least on the broker side be subscribing to broker word in slightly as slightly sort of as willingly as they used to now i think there's a big bite to come there certainly anecdotally in the market we hear about the marsh uh, property and casualty resilience facility um, that most markets weren't fully aware is the sort of anecdotal feedback weren't fully aware of their exposure to the uh, to a, a pandemic piece um, so what those what those sort of that variety of market factors how they translate themselves um, typically to the sort of front end of an MGA is that we're certainly seeing that commissions are coming under increased scrutiny and whether that's getting passed down by by the Lloyd, Lloyd's performance review or the proliferation of broker facilities or follow whatever it is that's all of those things are probably contributing it to it, but it, but, it, but it is really obvious for us that on most of our MGAs, when we're having conversations with capacity, um, they, the, the conversations very quickly get to get, get, get to the commercials driving the success or the failure of it. I think just an observation, and, and, and I'm sure there's people in the, in, in the room that are, are seeing this themselves, what we are seeing as well is the re-emergence of of capacity wanting us to have aligned interests on 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 the mgas so whether it's uh, profit commissions or, or even loss corridors that kind of stuff we are seeing that as a uh, as a way of demonstrating sort of mutual self-belief in the in the plan or the strategy that we're trying to articulate uh, next slide please Gina. Thank you. Um, so so that, that first slide wasn't meant to be as doom and gloom as it might have sound, I promise you. So a, a few observations that, 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 that hopefully are a little bit uplifting. It, it's very clear to us as a predominantly a broking organisation uh, as part of the Aldona Group that MGAs are a really important part of our placement strategy. And likewise, when we speak to markets, when I have my hat on looking for capacity for our MGA businesses, it's clear that MGAs remain a really important, important part of an insurer's distribution. I think there's a few reasons for that. My, my sort of personal view, there's definitely MGAs are a fast track route to market. Um, by that, if you compare it to setting up an insurance risk taking vehicle or a syndicate in Lloyds or something like that, it's a much more attractive process. Um, I think that's reflected in in, in an ability to attract some really entrepreneurial underwriting talent. Um, and likewise, the, the, the capital that sits behind it as um, the private equity guys, certainly the history would tell us private, the private equity guys find MGAs a really attractive route into the insurance market. And there's various success stories, but you only need to look at the kind of multiples that CFC, for example, have, have achieved. Um, it's, uh, it's pretty oppressive stuff. So I wasn't meant to be too doom and gloom in the first slide. The last bullet point on that first bullet point, MGA definitely remained a really attractive proposition on both sides of the distribution landscape. I think if you'll indulge me, there's a, probably a few, a few points that, that when we look at how we source capacity for our MGA, that we try and stick really, really true to. I wouldn't go as far as saying that placement principles, but we do believe that that our MGAs should remain focused on, on, on doing what they're good at, right? So yes, staying true to their roots, but actually sort of recognizing that, particularly if they've been reasonably successful, that, that they've been successful because they have probably expertise in that space, probably access to unique distribution, and certainly a degree of sort of USPs that a traditional capacity provider probably couldn't get to themselves for whatever reason. I think the other thing is, increasingly we're seeing the importance that, that that data plays in both articulating the the, the picture and the journey that the mga has been on but also the ability to forward model 
and the ability to articulate the plan. And when we're talking to capacity about about sort of making that link with us and giving us their capacity to sit behind one of our NGOs, then they've got to believe in the plan with us. And I think I think insurers are getting increasingly, um, as you will all experience, as we all are, but frankly, sort of day to day, data driven, and have a requirement to um, to make sure that they can justify their decisions of capacity deployment. Um, quite often, based on views of the actuaries, etc. So. I think I think that that's probably sort of it in terms of the background, the, the kind of stuff I, I, I wanted to talk about. I'm really happy at the end to, to take any questions. But having given you the back, backdrop of some of the challenges we're facing, and then having tried to underline though, that we feel that certainly with my broken hat on, the MGAs are a critical part of our, our placement and distribution landscape. Um, for me, talking to people like Robus about how MGAs can consider alternative sources of capacity, uh, whether it's reinsurance vehicles, direct writing vehicles, et cetera, is a, is a really important and increasingly prevalent part of the journey. So without further ado, I'll hand <coughs> over to Jamie. Okay. Thank you, Steve. And um, yes, if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, so just following on from, from uh, Steve's presentation, um, we'll focus on looking at the, the various different uh, insurance and reinsurance solutions which might be available to MGAs. Um, and the one is, is what exactly a risk retention vehicle is. Um, so that would be a special purpose insurance or reinsurance vehicle, depending on whether it's direct, you know, if it's direct writing when we come on to later, or perhaps a reinsurance vehicle in Guernsey. And it's established, um, primarily to, to sharing the risk and written the book of business that's being produced by the MGA. Um, and, the, and the real benefits that, um, <clears throat> that an MGA can have through that is that it has, an, you know, it can have an enhanced control, enhanced risk management. Um, it provides good stability um, when it comes to or options, uh, when it comes to capacity issues. And, you know, critically important is that it also allows you to have a, a share in a, any, if you've got a profitable uh, book of business, then just looking at the, the commissions that you'd be receiving um, at, at present, you can also take a share in, in uh, your underwriting profits. And also, as Steve mentioned uh, in his slide, um, we've seen it in the past. We've looked after MGA vehicles where they've been set up and it's, uh, you know, and the underwriting profit is specifically been to show an alignment of interest with, the, with their um, insurance and reinsurance panel, just to show that they have the skin in the game and that they're putting their own capital at risk. And so it obviously gives the market confidence on that. <clears throat> um, in terms of actually setting up your own risk bearing vehicle and putting your own capital at risk, it's obviously a, it's, it's a big step. It's a change of direction, I guess. Um, and it needs careful consideration. Uh, um, when we look, um, there are uh, several kind of main criteria um, that we would look at um, for any kind of MGA, and it needs to have uh, sufficient scale, so uh, sufficient premium volume <clears throat> to make it worthwhile. Um, it needs to have an MJ would need to have a, a good historical track record in terms of its underwriting performance uh, because there you wouldn't want to be setting up uh, your own risk bearing vehicle if it was if you had obviously had you know, significant losses in your portfolio. Um, <clears throat> the MGA also should have a, a clear risk appetite, so that's really important to to understand what kind of capital that it wants to invest in, in the vehicle what kind of limits, uh, whether it's in each loss or in the aggregate, what kind of risk appetite that it's prepared to accept. It's also obviously got to have access, so um, not only perhaps at the outset of setting up the vehicle, but perhaps along the journey, and depending on how results go, um, whether or not it needs to inject further capital at some point. Um, the final point is um, perhaps not quite as essential, but just sometimes having shorter tail business because um, you know, if you have long tail business in your own vehicle, then um, you do need to go through that runoff process. Um, and that might be, you know, that, that, that can be a longer process. Um, so if you could just go to the next slide, please. So when, <clears throat> when an MGA um, is looking at establishing a vehicle, um, we've, we've put down on this slide, there's, there's four real, uh, four clear steps which you would need to, to take. The first one is um, looking at 
a clear business rationale. And um, so, you know, the points that I've made, uh, I made on the previous slide. So it might be that you've got a really good uh, um, book of business where it's uh, you know, historically had good underwriting profits and you want to participate in that it might be the, the alignment of interest. But that's so that might be the rationale and it's got to fit within your wider group strategy um, before you proceed. So once you've once you've uh, thought about that and whether you do want to set up your vehicle, um, the, the typical next step would be look to look at um, having a feasibility study produced. Um, the feasibility study would work with, um, you know, whether it's Rabus as an insurance manager or, or a consulting firm or whoever it may be, will look at um, working with you to define what your strategic objectives are. Um, look at things like domicile, which jurisdiction is the most uh, appropriate for you, and it might be based on whether it's non-admitted or admitted writing, uh, what the capital requirements are, various different considerations, which we'll come on to on the next slide. Um, uh, that, that also help you evaluate what kind of structure is the best is best for you, whether it might be a, a cell in a cell company or a standalone vehicle. So there's different considerations on that, and then it will also analyse what your um, existing product lines are and what the what the claims analysis looks like to, to determine which products uh, would be best uh, suited for for a vehicle. Um, depending on the outcome of the feasibility study, if that if that kind of gives you the green light to proceed, um, you would then look at um, you'd move on to the the, the formation and the licensing stage. Um, and for that, um, you would need to produce a, a business plan, and you again you work with um, your insurance manager um, such as Rabus, um, and they would produce a, a three to five year financial business plan. That is something that would, that's obviously key to you to understand what your what your company might look like in terms of profitability, but it's also required for the for the regulatory application. Um, and along with that, it will determine, um, would do capital modeling to see what kind of funding considerations there are and how much capital is required for your vehicle. And then finally, once you've once you've moved past that stage, it will be it was onto that implementation. So completing the regulatory uh, license um, and then and, and submitting it and introducing you to all of the third party providers that you would need to so if you've got your own vehicle um, and it whether it's based in Guernsey to brought on myself you would typically need uh, someone to be providing the support services um, around that so you might you need to appoint auditors you need to have a board of directors unless you're, you you've got a cell you need to have bankers and so all of those kind of processes are part Part of the application process and, and would work you know with with, with the MGAs to, to, to look at uh, setting that up um, so just moving on to the next slide um, you know when, when one of the one of the points that I mentioned that is quite critical um, is is the jurisdiction assessment um, which domicile you want to set up and, and this will depend on um, you know what capital you have available what classes of business you're um, looking to write has to be written on a, a direct basis into the UK and um, so you have so you have that uh, UK access or whether it can be written on a reinsurance basis um, um, and again this that would typically be being in Guernsey but when can Considering the jurisdiction um, assessment, we just detailed on this slide six different areas. I won't, won't run into all of them in, in too much detail, but <clears throat> the first one is the regulatory environment. So what the approach and the reputation of the regulator is, because you obviously want to set up your vehicle in a in a well-respected jurisdiction. Um, you need to you you might look at the the, the tax considerations that, that were mentioned there in number two. Um, very important it will be insolvency requirements so if setting up in in um, say a Gibraltar or a Malta um, you know you'll be within a solvency two um, regime so the, all that, that comes with that um, if you're looking on a on a reinsurance or or you can you can write some Guernsey on a non-admitted basis but um, that Guernsey itself is um, has its own risk-based regime. It's not part of solvency solvency two, so it has a, a different requirement, which is which is typically obviously lower. Uh, then you need to look at on number four. Look at the speed um, and cost of implementation. So, um, you know, if you're looking if you're looking from 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 the moment you want to set up a vehicle to the point of actually having it operational, then that might be say for a standalone vehicle. Uh, around three months three to four months depending on how smooth the process is so it's quite quite a quite a slick um, time scale in terms of 
from from beginning to end, which is which is um, you know obviously very beneficial to the MGAs, um, depending on what your timescales are. Then looking at things like the labour pool in whatever domicile you choose to make sure that it's got um, insurance managers um, who can provide the services, that it's got um, um, you know globally renowned banks or recognised banks, audit firms, law firms, all of the um, different services that you'll require um, for your vehicle. And then finally, um, the market status and reputation. So again, going into a into a market such as such as Guernsey, which has a, a long um, long insurance uh, history, um, you know, a very established industry, and is uh, you know is well known and well respected. So so, so that, that all of that will form you know that will form part of the feasibility study and will be an important step in any consideration that you make. Um, so just moving on to the to the next slide. Um, I will specifically uh, look at um, look at it from a Guernsey angle because um, so, so I, I, I myself am based in Guernsey, so we we've um, you know had lots of involvement with um, helping out MGAs and looking at setting looking um, at setting up structures for them. Um, so um, as I mentioned earlier, this is predominantly on a reinsurance basis. Uh, there, are, there are certain times where we can write direct on a non-admitted basis, but it's, but it's um, generally reinsurance. So moving on to the next slide, um, this gives you a, an overview of Guernsey as a domicile. Um, so Guernsey um, is the leading, one of the leading captive insurance domiciles in Europe, as at the previous uh, year end, there were 606 international insurers, so lots, lots of, uh, lots of vehicles here. 333 of those were uh, standalone, standalone licensed vehicles, and 273 are protected cells within a, a protected cell company. Just going through the other points for Guernsey, we've got um, obviously regulation and law is, is important. So Guernsey has a well-established insurance law. Um, the Guernsey Financial Services Commission are a well-respected regulator. Um, they are very approachable. They're, they support innovation, um, which is again can be key to, to, to an MGA looking to, to set up. Um, the next bullet point mentions innovation. So um, Guernsey um, created the protected cell structure, protected cell company structure, um, quite some time ago now, and uh, that that um, is that is now established throughout the world. It's accepted. It's um, it's a Good, it's a good vehicle for insurance companies in terms of if they want to set up just a, a, a cell of their own or if they want to set up a protected cell company to, to um, look after different segments of their business. Um, solvency uh, is another uh, critical consideration. So as, as I mentioned, Guernsey has a MC2 um, regime. It has a prescribed uh, risk-based uh, solvency uh, regime. And that looks at uh, different areas such as um, such as um, premium risk, reserve risk, market risk, and default risk. But it is, but it is, whilst it's um, whilst it's risk based, it, it, typically it will be less onerous than a solvency two uh, regime. And then the final two items are infrastructure. So Guernsey, we have all of the main uh, financial service providers, um, all of the big audit firms, all of the you know, global UK or global banks and lots of um, well-respected offshore uh, law. And then finally, what is also important for, for yourselves and for, for people in, uh, in the UK is the fact of, you know, Guernsey is a very close one flight away from, from, uh, from, from the UK. So um, good for obviously having management meetings, board meetings and conducting your business. Um, uh, through Guernsey. So just moving on to the next slide, please. Um, here we've got the, got the main MGA type structures which you might consider looking for your vehicle if you wanted to. We've got three main corporate structures which are either a standalone company, a protected cell company or an incorporated cell company. Um, standalone company is, is just, a, just a limited a standard company as I said, it can be set up within three months. Um, you would you would have a representation on your own company's board. Um, it could be branded to, to, to your MGA. Um, you have perhaps a, 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 you know, more control over over the decision making process on that. Um, so you know that will be the 
the uh, a, a very good up but also you might want to set up your own protected cell company and uh, so a protected cell company is it's one legal entity but it's divided into the core and then it also has you can set up an unlimited number of cells um, and so you might want to set up your own PCC and you want to put and you, the reason for doing that is that you want to segregate um, your different portfolios or your different books of business into a ring fence protected cell where the assets and liabilities events and it just segregates it and it might it's a, it can be a, a neat option for that uh, the other structure is an incorporated cell company which is very similar to a, a pcc um the the difference is that the each cell within within an incorporated cell company is its own cell. so it has um it, it has its own board it has uh, has to have its own audit um but it, it can be beneficial in terms of looking at um, clearer segregation um, and also one one distinction is that one incorporated cell can transact with them but the, the, you know I, th I think for MGAs we we predominantly just see either standalone companies or protected cell companies and then on the right side of the slide um, depending on the volume of business that you might have and also what you're looking at and what you're, you, you you can look at just setting up a protected cell in a third party owned PCC. So for instance, Rabus has um, its own PCC and we set up, we've set up uh, cells for MGAs where they just want a reinsurance facility. They don't want all of the governance and the, the, the management spent um, where they would do on a, on a standalone company. And also it offers a, a, a more cost efficient method and it's slightly quicker to set up. And also depending on, on what type of what it's doing it can also be a more capital efficient way of um, of transacting your business and then finally there is a cell in a in a third party incorporated cell company those just really are that is an option but it's, it's and Robus again has an ICC but it, it, it there's not much in the way of uh, difference um, from a standalone company um, so moving on to the next slide <clears throat> okay, so in this slide, um, set out um, an example of what an MGA, what, what a reinsurance structure will, will look like. And um, just to give you a clear picture, this is this is a structure that we have used um, on on MGAs that we've got currently with MGAs, and it's uh, it is the most common way for um, an MGA participating in Guernsey um, within their own book of business. So you're seeing them. Middle of the middle of the slide, you've got Delves, the MGA um, sitting there. At the moment, you your structure is that you'd, you'd have a delegated underwriting authority. So you're writing a book of business for your insurer or insurance panel and, uh, and issuing policies to the insured. And, and then you might, and then there might be quote share reinsurance or some other type of insurance dropping down from the insurer to an external reinsurance panel. So where this where the your structure might come in to set up your own risk retention vehicle is. Is the purple arrow which goes, drops down is is would be injecting capital into your own MGA MGA owned reinsurance company or cell, and then setting up a a quote it could be a quote share reinsurance from the insurance panel to your own vehicle, taking whatever risk uh, is in line with your your risk appetite. So it could be take ten percent quote share, you could take fifty percent quote share. Obviously, taking into account what the capital requirements might be. And and you know what the potential downside can be, obviously as well. Um, and, and it also can you can also set it up as a, as an ex, excess of loss, or you can have a stop loss at the back to to limit uh, what the potential losses that you have within your own vehicle. Um, and then just the final part on that slide is that you've got the you've got the Guernsey Insurance Manager, which provides all of the insurance services and the running the management of your vehicle, um, things like so. It's a full service provision. It's, it's Things like uh, under insurance service, uh, accounting, compliance officers, uh, uh, money laundering reporting officer, uh, company secretarial services, all, all all of that, so that so that um, you know the vehicle is keeping in line with all, all of the regulatory requirements um, in Guernsey. So just moving on to the next slide. Um, again, this is this is an example um, just to illustrate what it might look like if you were. To capture some of your underwriting profits, so um, on the left you've got the the typical uh, typical kind of existing structure. Just an example based on a book of business with say five million gross written premiums, 
um, and uh, in this example, a 40% uh, loss ratio on a gross basis. Gross basis. Um, so in, on the left-hand side, the MGA would typically be um, obviously earning its uh, revenue through its commissions, which is in the top of there, just so as an example, 30%, and that would be the basis of what you, what you receive. And then the underwriting profit below that is going out to the external market. So just flipping it over to the, to the right-hand model, um, you, you obviously still retain your commission um, for, for, for writing the business as an MGA. But if you then set up your own vehicle, um, you can then obviously capture some of that underwriting profit. So in this example, it's showing us 20%, which would be a, a million. It's obviously dependent on, on, on having a good claims history. So again, if, if that 40% claims were to increase, then, it, then that erodes the profit. But if it, if it improves, then, then obviously it increases the profit. Um, but this just demonstrates why it's a good risk management tool um, for you to, to obviously see how the how the book of business is going and and uh, you know align your interests with your with your reinsurance panel. Um, and then the final slide from me on the next slide is just a bit of an overview. So we've got these slides which we can which we can send out after after this. Um, so don't worry too much about the detail, but. Um, this is around the Guernsey Capital Solvency Rules, um, which were implemented in 2015. So there's three different requirements. There's the minimum capital requirement. So the, the absolute minimum that you need to set up a standalone vehicle in Guernsey is £100,000 or currency equivalent. Um, that doesn't apply if you set up your own protected cell. Um, but, uh, and then the minimum capital requirement is 12% of whatever your net written premiums are. So it's your gross written premiums, less whatever commissions, less any reinsurance premiums. So as an example, under the minimum capital requirement for every million pound of net written premiums that you write, you would need as a minimum 120,000 pound of capital. Plus you need to allow a margin above that. The prescribed capital requirement is, uh, is a risk-based um, formulaic approach which, uh, as I mentioned previously, looks at premium risk, reserve risk, default risk, and market risk, and has various different capital factors depending on what type of business you're writing. Um, it also has different confidence levels depending on whether you're classified as a captive or as a commercial general reinsurer or a direct writing commercial insurer. Um, and then finally, the, um, the, each company is also required to have its own solvency capital assessment which is the directors, um, it's their own consideration of what they believe the capital required might be. Um, and again, we're going to too much detail, detail on that, but the, the key ones are the prescribed capital requirement and the minimum capital requirement. So on that note, that's, that's gone through uh, the Guernsey options. I'll hand over to my colleague, Andy, and uh, he'll move on to the, the options that we have um, in, in Gibraltar. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. Um, if we could, um, you know, what I'll do is I'll just give a quick overview of the Gibraltar market as it is now. Uh, what we're seeing in the market at the moment, we, you know, in the way of um, activity um, with regards to new business coming into Gibraltar and also give a, um, you know, a, a couple of specific examples of, um, uh, you know, applications and uh, businesses that we're working with in the MGA space. Um, if we could go into the first slide, and I'll just um, give, you know, Gibraltar um, is, a, is a pretty well-established um, uh, insurance domicile. Um, we, there are over 50 regulated insurance entities. There are a few captive insurers here, but uh, it's not really a captive domicile. It's... Um, in fact, most of the captive insurers here are, are in runoff. Um, but the, you know, it's mainly a direct writing um, uh, uh, domicile. We write direct into the UK post Brexit. Unfortunately, we've lost the right to the ability to write into um, the European Union, which is unfortunate. But uh, the, the vast majority of the, the direct writing companies here are, are UK focused anyway. It's got the same regulatory regime as the UK and Europe. It's Solvency 2 jurisdiction, um, which is great because then everything is, you know, the regulatory regime is the same. 
Uh, we have reciprocal uh, market access to the UK and the UK obviously, so it's essentially it's a single market between the UK and Gibraltar. <clears throat> uh, we've got a, 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 a great relationship, I, I feel, with the, uh, uh, the, uh, Guernsey, the Gibraltar Financial Services Commission. Um, they're very approachable and they're um, and uh, that they are um, uh, easily accessible, which is you know not the case in some other jurisdictions that I've worked in um, historically. Um, and uh, the government in Gibraltar is also um, very um, enthusiastic about the insurance industry because it creates a lot of business and stuff like that. Um, and uh, hence, it's uh, you know uh, we it is. Uh, at the moment, a growing um, sector. You know, we've got some pretty big companies here. Over 25% of the um, UK motor market is written out of Gibraltar. You know, you've got companies uh, owned by Saga, um, Admiral, uh, Hastings, um, First Central that uh, you know write direct into the UK. You know, so they're they're you know big motor riders um, and have a big market share of the UK market. Um, if we can move on to the next slide, and I'll just give it a, a, <clears throat> a view of you know what we're seeing in the market at the moment is uh, that is is driven by um, a lot of the stuff that Steve talked about earlier. You know the the um, capacity issues, uh, you know the market um, difficulties that MGAs are having. Um, we're we're aware of uh, you know several um, MGAs that have had their um, capacity removed at short notice, um, and we're seeing hence uh, an interest in MGAs of um, trying to establish uh, you know more security over their capacity, um, which means that uh, uh, you, you know the, the our workload has actually increased. We've got a lot of um, new applicate new uh, prospects and um, applications and process. Um, I won't, uh, you know, we've, I'm cognizant of the fact that we're sort of running out of time, so I won't spend too much time on on what's driving these capacity issues. But you know, that I think the Lloyd's ten, the Lloyd's Decile ten review is is something that it comes up again and again, and discussions with MGAs that are writing that type of business. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> Um, at the moment, we've got um, um, you know us and um, the other you know other insurance managers in the market. Where we are um, seeing a significant increase in, in interest. As I said, uh, what we have um, uh, got in process at the moment, we're working with it, um, several MGAs uh, for applications for not UK non-standard motor. Um, these are driven by, you know, uh, the capacity concerns, and some of these MGAs have uh, uh, has used uh, other European carriers in the past, and that capacity is now just, um, you know, there's been a couple of failures in in Europe, which has not helped. Uh, the insure tech um, uh, sector is is. Uh, a growing area of um, interest, you know, MGAs with an insurer tech background, we're uh, seeing the interest in them, from them, and establishing their own um, capacity. Uh, other examples of we've, uh, at the moment, we're working with a, um, a life PCC option, which is quite interesting and probably unique for, for this part of the world. Uh, there's where there's a, an industry specific undertaking which is looking at using um, P, uh, an SPV, a special purpose PCC in Gibraltar as well. Um, but if we can move into the next slide, and this is um, an example of, of uh, using the PCC legislation, which Jamie mentioned. Uh, originated in Guernsey, but has been adopted by several insurance um, domiciles around the world, including Gibraltar, uh, Malta, for example. Uh, and uh, at the moment, we're working with a uh, capital provider who has had similar, you know, who, who has 
uh, look, where we've got an application to establish a protected cell vehicle, which is essentially designed um, for use by MGAs. You know, they, they've come across issues in the market themselves that have driven them to consider establishing a vehicle that they could use themselves for their own business, but realised that they would be able to provide facilities for other um, entities. Um, it is a PCC vehicle, um, and it, um, it is uh, designed for perhaps smaller books of business. You know, we, I think the, the, the books of business we're looking at at the moment are, you know, range between three to 10 to 12 million um, of, you know, specific types of business. Um, and uh, they uh, are willing to um, rent cells to other um, um, MGAs or brokers, for example. And um, the, the great advantage of a vehicle like this is it's actually a very cost effective way of getting into the market and it will be unique. It will be the first um, direct riding uh, um, PCC using cells to write direct to the public. Um, and so we're very excited about it. Obviously, there are restrictions and the regulator is, is uh, cognizant of the fact that uh, we are uh, minimizing the risk involved, but it is a very exciting um, entity. Uh, we on to the next slide. I think one of the things that you've got to consider is that uh, Gibraltar is primarily for UK business. Um, we do have a Malta operation, so for those MGAs that are writing um, uh, uh, business that uh, in Europe, uh, we, we are able to um, help or potentially help you with um, Malta because that has, uh, you know, obviously the same Solvency 2 regime as we have in Gibraltar in the UK, and um, it also has PCC legislation and um, has a number of direct writing companies that write into Europe. Um, with regards to Gibraltar, the regulator, um, you know, we find it a very responsive body. Um, the industry has pretty good relationships with them and good communication channels. Uh, you know, they're very approachable, particularly in the prudential team. They're, you know, they're um, uh, easily accessible and open for discussions. So any um, issues that we have, uh, we have an avenue to um, discuss them with directly with the regulator in, in fairly short timeframes. Um, they do, particularly uh, with, you know, newer established businesses, so, you know, they require a substantive presence in Gibraltar, so you need key function holders based here. Um, and, uh, you know, but we're finding particularly that they are taking a fairly pragmatic view of that. Um, and uh, so, and also probably, you know, uh, a proportionate um, view, but uh, it, it is something that has to be considered. You do need people on the ground here and the insurance managers do help you with that, um, but there are, um, you know, requirements. Um, it is a fairly cost, um, you, you know, it, it is probably more cost effective to set up in a, a carrier in Gibraltar than it is in the UK at the moment. And also the, there is a, a time difference. You know, we find that uh, although the, you know, it, it's not a quick process, but it is um, probably a more efficient and effective process than, than um, you would be used to in the UK. Um, there's a lot of um, expertise in the market in Gibraltar. We've got uh, uh, a significant um, uh, experience base, you know, having been a, you know, a direct writing of um, domicile for about 20 years. And it, um, we work very well with um, service providers in the UK market and uh, had very close links with, uh, you know, various reinsurance brokers, et cetera. Um, and also, uh, so it is, a, a domicile that um, we that uh, we're very enthusiastic about at the moment. You know, particularly on a day like today, which is very sunny, um, not like the weekend when it rained non-stop for um, 
about three days. Um, so we feel that there is a, a lot of uh, opportunities and, uh, and uh, the ability to help MGAs with um, any capacity, with capacity issues that they may have. Um, we're very um, interested in um, helping the, the local industry grow and also uh, work with uh, um, people to grow the business, grow their businesses. I think that's, I think we've got a little bit of time for some questions. Um, we haven't got all that much time, unfortunately. We seem to have gone a little bit longer than I expected. Thanks for that, Andy. And um, of course, to Jamie and Steve, um, a good account there, I think, of the um, opportunities for risk retention vehicles in the Guernsey and Gibraltar domiciles. So thank you for that. I do have a couple of questions. Um, we have only got a few minutes, so if you're able to answer these relatively briefly, great. But if not, um, as I said before, um, it'll, if you could pick these up after the presentation directly with those uh, asking the question. So the first one, um, what advantages does Guernsey have over say, Bermuda? Um, I think this was touched upon. I think one of the things was the fact that it's close to UK and it's central to Europe. But... Um, Andy, Steve, or Jamie, do you want to answer that one? Yeah, I mean, well, I think I think that the location is definitely one. Um, the fact that um, the the um, the solvency regime that we have in Guernsey is um, is uh, good and, and it's very positive in terms of setting up whether it's a, a commercial general reinsurer or a, or a pure captive or a direct writing commercial insurer. So it has the, it's very it's proportionate to the requirements of of what you're writing. Um, so, so I think that, and just the, the 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 regulatory regime that we have, and the speed in which we can, um, which we can set up vehicles. As I said, we set up a, um, a, both a, a standalone vehicle and sale vehicles for MGAs last year, and they were done. Uh, the projects were carried out and implemented within. Um, yeah, I think the, the regulatory application, and one of them was about five weeks, and and then so it's just the lead in time to that. So it's a very quick process. Um, yeah, and so it's, so it's just a, a good jurisdiction, I think, for that. Thanks, Jamie. Um, so another one, this is specifically for Steve. As a major broker in the market, when you're sourcing MGA capacity, what are the most important factors that you consider the insurer partner must have and portray? Uh, yeah, good, good question. Um, I, think, I think sort of keeping it short and succinct, um, certainty of capacity and longevity of capacity. Um, I think both of those, as a, when we're looking at it from an MGA perspective, we need a real clear message that we're able to give to distribution partners, so to our brokers, uh, our producers, that kind of stuff. And, and, and certainty and longevity is probably the, the two most underlying things. The only thing I would add, actually, is that from a broker to understand how that MGA plays into the insurer's broader deployment of capital strategy is really interesting i.e. understanding how important that MGA is to the insurer um, gives us a, a nice balance to the relationship. Thanks for that, Steve. Okay, so I'm conscious of time, so I just wanted to say once again, thank you very much to Andy, Steve and Jamie for the presentation. It was interesting, lots of information on there and um, the slide deck, you've uh, given your approval for us to share that, so lots of information on there that... I'm sure will be of uh, interest to our MGAs as a reference point. Um, so thanks to all of our participants for joining us today. Um, please don't forget to provide your feedback um, and please look out for forthcoming MGAA events. Have a great day all.